Hello, everyone. It is your favorite frustrated producer, Matthew Kadish, coming to you Thursday nights for our live stream. And I'm really excited tonight because I've got uh, uh, one of my all-time favorite authors on the stream to talk to me about uh, his legendary career and some of the franchises that he's been working on. And I can't wait to get into it with him. And But just like every important person on planet Earth, his time is very limited. So we only got him for an hour. Um, but we're going to try to get through as much as we can through that hour. So if you guys have questions for him, drop them in Super Chats. Super Chats will be guaranteed to get read to uh, Mr. Kevin J. Anderson. Um, so without further ado, I would like to introduce the man, the myth, the legend, uh, Mr. Kevin J. Anderson himself. Sir, thank you so much. My first question to you is, what does it feel like to be a legend in your own time? Do you ever just wake up and then like, damn, I'm, I'm a legend. <laughs> what am I doing here? Well, actually, a lot of Star Wars fans complain when there's a Legends banner on top of my Star Wars book. So that's, <laughs> that's I guess that's a whole different uh, set of questions there. But, you know, I've had a long career. I, I published my first story when I was 12 years old and published my first novel when I was 25. And I just, I never, ever wanted to be anything else. And uh, I've kind of got this whole thing that I talk about this, uh, I call it kind of like the false summits because I climb mountains. I live here in, in Colorado and I climb a lot of mountains. And one of the things about climbing mountains is as you're climbing the mountain, you kind of see the, the, the summit ahead of you. You see this ridge and you're getting to the top and you get to the top. But when you actually get to the top, you see that there's actually a bigger summit that's just behind it that you couldn't see because it was blocked out. So then you climb to that one and then you get to the top of that second summit and you realize, oh, that's another false summit and there's something even bigger beyond that. And that's kind of what my career has been like all the way through, you know, first getting my first short story published and then my first novel published and then get invited to write Star Wars and then getting my first New York Times bestseller and then getting my first uh, I don't know Nebula Award nomination. And then my yeah, so option so for all kinds for of people that. who for people who don't know how amazingly awesome you are, I, I just I want to toot your, your horn for, for, for a second. Uh, so you've published over 120 books, probably closer to 160 now. Uh, 50 of which have been on the U.S. and international bestseller list. You've been a New York Times bestselling author many many times. Um, you've got over 23 million books in print. Um, you were named, along with Stephen King, as uh, Colorado Authors Hall of Fame in 2021. Uh, you were also, like your very first book, I believe it was Resurrection Incorporated, uh, was, was um, nominated for the Bram Stoker Award for Best First Novel. I mean, like you've, you've, got, you've got a list of achievements, like as long as my arm here. And uh, you also, uh, you published something like insane amount, like seven or eight books a year. Isn't that right? Well, compared to some of like my my twenty books to fifty k friends, that's peanuts right now. Uh, but, <laughs> well, well, yeah, but I mean, like you actually write like actual like big novels, like not just like you know, like oh, I'm going to put out a fifty thousand word, you know, like something or other. Well, I I I'm not being snarky here, but I write the stuff that I think I'm interested in writing. I mean, I sometimes I'll write stupid, funny. I've got a whole series with a. A zombie private detective, the Dan Shamble series. And those I just love writing. They're so much fun. But then I also write these big fat Dune books with my friend Brian Herbert. Uh, I write you know, steampunk fantasies with uh, the drummer from Rush, Neil Peart. Um, I write a bunch of my own solo stuff and, and I write comics every month. And, and you know, this is what I enjoy doing. This is what I love to do. Um, and if I ever slowed down, I think my head would explode because all the stories just keep backing so, up. So I'm an author. I don't know if you knew this about me. I've, I've, I've published novels. My last novel was about three years ago. It's been, I've been working on my next one. It's been taking me like forever. So I have a question for you. In, in fact, um, I believe that uh, George R. R. Martin can ask it best. So I'm just going to play this for you right now. George, we're going to have to wrap this up pretty soon. Is there anything that you've always wanted to ask me? <laughs> because, George, I will. <laughs> yes, yes, there is something I want to ask you. All right. How the fuck do you write so many books so fast? <laughs> Kevin, how do you write so many books so fast? I need to know your secret. Well, I write all the time. <laughs> every day, every single day, seven days a week, I'm out writing something and you kind of have to uh, pry me away from either writing or editing because this is 
these are all my imaginary friends. These are my stories I want to tell. And, and, you know, I consider it a, a job. There are, um, in fact, maybe we should just play this and bring George Martin on here. So listen, like, <laughs> George, finish the damn book. Finish and, the book. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, and in fact, I, thanks to George, he's given me this great way to sell. I just finished, um, the third book came out last January, this big, huge epic fantasy trilogy called uh, The Spine of the Dragon is the first one. And they're, each one of these is like 600 page books and they're huge stories. And he and George gave me this great marketing line that I get to say, this is a huge epic fantasy like Game of Thrones, only mine is finished. And <laughs> you know, it just works. And um, and I, I do, I write every day. I've been writing a comic script today. So I'm I haven't actually been out dictating, but I usually like to go out uh, for a walk. I dictate. I've got, um, where is it? Somewhere around here. Digging. There we go. Looking around because I'm doing this in my office. This is my um, my digital recorder. I'll go out and I'll just walk and I'll talk to myself. There's uh, that three minutes and 25 seconds. That was me outlining the panels of the next um comic book page i was going to write this script so on. is that one of your secrets to writing so quickly is, is you do dictation basically well it's not actually a secret i've written a whole book about it and everything but <laughs> um i think that it certainly helps because one of the things that i really like to do so much is to go out hiking and i live here in beautiful colorado i can go out in the mountains and the waterfalls and the forests and that's my office and i'll just go out on the trail and i'll instead of thinking up sentences and then typing them as I sit in a cramped old office, I get to be out doing the other thing I love best and being out in, in the mountains or in, out, out in nature. And, you know, it kind of forces you to get something done because um, you're out walking and I've got to finish a chapter before I can turn around and come back. So um, that's, it's sort of an incentive to get things done and well you know i i live out here in las vegas the devil's butthole and if i go outside i'll melt um so like that's not an option for me but like i, I think it's so fascinating because i've heard other authors who use like dictation software where they'll actually write the book as they're uh you know speaking about it so like that that's one of your secrets to being so prolific is like you know you, you do your dictation do you transcribe it yourself or do you have an assistant do that like how does that well, work I, I have a typing service that i do it i I know some people are using like speech to text uh, mm -hmm. software and things, but you know, I'm writing Dune novels and there's so many freaking strange words and all those things that it would just melt down dragon naturally speaking or something. And do, I, do, does your service have to work under like an NDA or like, are they like a super lockdown because like you wouldn't want the Dune stuff, uh, you know, getting out before it's published. Right. Well, I mean that it, it's a professional typing service and they have an NDA because they're also working for, lawyers and doctors and things mm -hmm. and, and you know people might find my dune book a little bit more interesting but they do have to be secret as far as like your colonoscopy results that they're transcribing <laughs> or something so it's a a valid typing service and the other thing about having humans do it is that they know when to put paragraphs in and they know when to put punctuation and commas and quote marks and everything and it just saves me a lot of a lot of trouble so anyway that's that's one of my um, secrets and the other is is that I just I, I just like to write. I mean that's my uh, my thing. I remember going over to my my mother in laws. My my wife and I will go over and it's like Sunday afternoon and we'll have Sunday lunch and and the other families there and and they want to play card games. They want to watch the football and I'm just like sweating because I'm like an addict. I want to get back to doing my editing <laughs> and and my mother in law said you know. Kevin, you work too hard. Why don't you just stay here with us and watch the football game? And I'm like going, but that's the hard work. I don't enjoy that. I enjoy <laughs> writing stories. And um, so I am I guess I'm yeah. a freak of nature. I like to write all the time. Well, well it's like, uh, what did the Chinese say? If you like what, if you love what you do, you never work a day in your life, right? Yeah. So like that, that's the, the thing. And it's kind of funny because, you know, you and I, we've both gone to these in, in the author conferences. And when I'm there, like I have friends who are like very successful independent authors. And even at like a, you know, networking event or something like that, they're, they're like, oh, I got to run up back to my room because I, I got to edit, you know, my novel for like tomorrow or something like that. Like, the people who are like just really successful in the space are always working i've found and you know like i think that applies to you but uh mo moving on because like you know i got so much i want to talk to you about so um 
you know, when I was a kid, uh, my, my parents, we, we were stationed in Germany overseas. I was like kindergarten age. And uh, the only English speaking video we had was like a, a old beat up VHS uh, dub of Star Wars, the, the, the first one, episode four. And so I basically grew up on that movie. And when we moved back to the States and I found out there was a trilogy complete, I was like, oh my God, like, you know, this is insane. And for the longest time, we only had three Star Wars movies. And then something happened in like the early 90s where Timothy Zahn published, you know, his trilogy. And Star Wars fans who had been just thirsting for new stuff just ate that up. And I can remember going through that trilogy. And then I, when I finished it, I was like, man, I want more of this stuff. And that's when your books came out. You were like, you know, the second uh, to actually, you know, publish like a Star Wars spinoff novel. And in fact, I wanted to show you these. So like I've got, you know, my original from like the 90s when I was in high school and like I, yes. I got your, your your work, you know, like Dark Apprentice was like my favorite one. And um, I tore through these. I read them like multiple times. It was a long time ago, so I don't remember them all that well. But when I was in high school, I was like obsessed with you because I was like, man, this Kevin J. Anderson guy really knows how to write Star Wars. Um, so I wanted to ask you a little bit about your work and, and you know, some of the other, uh, because like you've written so many Star Wars novels by this point. And when um, The Force Awakens came out, you know, Disney decided to make the decision to decanonize a lot or pretty much every expanded universe novel. And so I was just wondering, um, you, you know, how did it feel to like have all your contributions and the contributions of all the other uh, Star Wars authors rolled back um, like like that? Like, did they let give you guys a heads up to let you know that they were going to do that? Like, like, did you... Were you insulted by that? I, I was just curious, like how you reacted when you found out. I'm not sure anybody told us about it. But I'm, look, I've got mine here, but they're brand new in this little fancy box box set thingy that I can show off. And if you look, look at that, I'm the legendary author now. It says legends on the top of each one. Of those <laughs> and, um, and in fact, you're you're gonna put a link, right? I've got a store where I'm. I will sign copies of these and send them out for uh, anybody who who is interested in getting them but yeah, that link that link is in the description by the way for anyone who uh who wants to it's bookfire right bookfire.com it's wordfire wordfire, wordfire. Word, that's my publishing house the wordfire shop is the see we had because we used to do so many comic cons all over the place and i'd be selling books like crazy to fans and then the pandemic hit and i ended up with a basement full of you know, tens of thousands of dollars worth of books sitting there on the shelves so that that finally kind of kicked us in the butt to get our web store going. So that's kind of how we're how we're working on all that. Anyway, back back to your question on it. Let me. I I told you I write a lot of comics, right? And so mm -hmm. let me put this in sort of a comics context because this is a, no surprise to you. I get this question a lot, and what actually surprises me uh, a little bit more is the the outrage and indignation that the Star Wars fans had about the fact of the movies not following the books. And there at the time, there were maybe like 300 books or something published. So, you know, it was no surprise to me that when somebody comes up to J.J. Abrams and says, do a new Star Wars movie, are they really going to say, but you also have to read these 350 books and don't make anything that contradicts anything in any of those books? It just, it I think that's a fair demand, yeah. don't you? <laughs> I, I, it just never occurred to me that they would ask that. But now getting back to comics, though. Um, so movie just a couple of months ago came out called The Batman, right? Mm -hmm. So did that decanonize all the Christian Bale Batman movies? And then did the Christian Bale Batman movies decanonize the Michael Keaton one? And it's just they're different, different paths of star wars and or, or batman and how many different um reboots of spider-man have there been how many different reboots of uh look dune just got remade as a movie and and i thought that they were just going well uh, the books are going to be in one one timeline and the the uh movies are going to be in a different one and you know look i would rather they had just made movies out of my books i've We'll, we'll just say that, right? Um, but I didn't think they were. And, you know, Timothy Zahn and I have talked about this a lot. And one of his greatest things is that it doesn't decanonize them. It just says they don't have to take everything in them. And one of the things Tim says is, but yeah, now they're called legends, but you do know that some legends are true, right? 
And so there, there are lots of things that I'm seeing in all the various new movies that are clearly somebody read my books and that's where they got it from. There's a lot of my things in the, the Clone Wars cartoons and in the, especially in the Han Solo movie. And, and there's some stuff in the um, episode seven, eight, nine. There's all kinds of things that as I'm sitting there in the audience, I get like this fanboy chills about me seeing, oh, I know where they got that from. And, oh, that's my character. Or, oh, that's my my setting that I did. Or and, they owe me a royalty check. <laughs> no, they don't owe me a royalty check because when you work for Star Wars, you're, you're a hired gun. You're a gun for hire, yeah. I got paid for my work and I enjoyed my work. And 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 you, Matt, and, and millions of other people picked up my Jedi Academy books and they loved them. And, and I'm so thrilled to have um, all those fans and they've, I mean, I've had people introduce me to their kids that they've named after characters in those books and things. So I, I couldn't be more honored. I couldn't be happier with what, uh, what they did, but um, I, I'm not going to boycott Lucasfilm because they put a legends banner on my book. So um, well, well, you know, you know, Kevin, they were all canon, but you know, that, that didn't happen. You, you know, uh, Kevin, I, I think the big difference, especially for Star Wars fans though, is that, so when in a case like Batman, you know, you have all the different variations of Batman, but with the Star Wars books, I mean, Lucasfilm or LucasArts, I should say, specifically had those things canonized, right? Like they were like, these are the official sequels to, to Star Wars. And we have like a whole division whose only job is to make sure all these books gel with one another. And so fans you know, felt kind of like, you know, like all this wonderful stuff was a little bit disrespected when they basically just said, oh, we're, we're, you know, th this is no longer canon. Well, I, um, I think they, they maybe could have handled it a little bit better. They they just sort of dumped it on everybody. And, and no, I don't think we, the authors, knew they were going to do that. And, uh, and then when episode, I forget, seven or eight or whichever one came out and there was some, some fan backlash and then you have kathleen kennedy from lucasfilm saying well it's harder for us to do movies because we have no books to base anything on and, yeah. and all of us authors just kind of went huh <laughs> i think all the fans also went what <laughs> well, and, and they did a similar thing with the the kenobi show which is starting soon right? like, in like a week uh, yeah. yeah or very soon and and somebody said this is a great show because we're exploring a character who's never been explored before and we're going but you know that you published an entire book called Kenobi, right? And, and <laughs> anyway, don't get me off of that that tangent. I, I just um, I, I really appreciate all the uh, all the support, and I mean that this was like really, really big level support the fans did that they all just kind of surrounded us so that we're going to defend you against Lucasfilm. And I said, yeah. well, you know, they're they're not actually sending tanks after us or anything, but uh, but they did really make a lot of. Um, noise to show how much they loved the the old eu and and i still just get so much of that and i'm very thrilled and kevin i think you, you know your experience with hollywood should tell you no one in hollywood reads and so like that's why well, they yeah. make those statements. Uh, well my my experiences with hollywood have been um it's like chasing fairy lights you spend so much time and so much effort and and uh and nothing ever comes of it we had like brian herbert and i worked really hard trying to get of uh, the new a new version of dune made and he and i worked uh i mean not only brian and i but but we were working for 25 years before the movie finally came out last fall uh 25 years that's how long it took i have another big graphic novel that i wrote with steven sears the producer of xena warrior princess and we did that it's called stalag x human pow's in an alien concentration camp it's been optioned by uh, the director of the Hunger Games and I Am Legend and Red Sparrow, and they got a script that they're writing it, and and it looks like it's going to go, but you know, I'm hoping. But we were pushing this for more than 20 years, and that's how long things take. And and it is so much talk and empty promises. And like I, I yeah. like to say that before before the Dune movie came out, I every year was like this trickle of empty promises from Hollywood. And then once Dune came out, I now have a flood of empty promises from Hollywood. So um, we'll see well, something gets made, but that's yeah. why I like writing books and comics because mm -hmm. I can write a book and I know damn well that book's going to get published. And when I write a comic script, it's for like boom studios and they, I know it's going to get published. 
And basically it's going to get published the way that I wrote it. And when a movie gets made, who knows, they could turn it into a musical on Mars or something by the yeah. time I'm done with it. And, well, it, it's funny. One time I ran into Brent Spiner, the guy who plays Data in The Next Generation, and I tried to give him a copy of my book, Earthman Jack, and he looked at it. He's like, is that a book? I was like, yeah, it's a book. He, he's like, he's like, man, I don't even read the scripts I get. <laughs> he's like, I, I can't read any books. So, I mean, that, that that's typical Hollywood uh, mentality for you is like people just don't read. But before we get going on to the next topic, we have a super chat for $4.99 from Gimpy G Gaming. And Gimpy's a, a great uh, fan of the podcast, and he's he's disabled. And he says, wow. Kevin, I have never taken a step due to muscular dystrophy, but your works let me explore worlds. Thanks so very much. I so. appreciate that. And I that is one of the things that when... When I was when I was a little kid, I grew up in this very tiny town uh, in Wisconsin. We had like 250 people, and there were more cows and silos than people, and cornfields. and And I was like the only person that I knew that read science fiction or comic books. And I just I would spend my time just thinking, how do I get out of this this boring trap that I'm in? There's nothing interesting here, and I would just journey in my imagination. And I I would. What my little motto on my website is I adventure hard so you don't have to. And I just love telling stories and taking people um, on another trip. And I'm, I'm really glad that I give you um, just just uh, basically a virtual vacation that you get to go and, and explore places with me and, and make friends with my characters before I kill them off and, um, <laughs> you know, doing terrible things. But I, I appreciate the uh, the great kind words, and and I hope you'll keep reading. Thanks. So you mentioned Dune a little bit earlier, and um, uh, I had heard a story about like you and and your friend Brian Herbert, who eventually found Frank Herbert's like notes for like a Dune sequel in some lockbox in a bank uh, somewhere. And I can only imagine that like you know when you went to the bank to open up that lockbox, it, it went a little something like this. Like, what, what were you feeling when, like, you went and, and, like, found, like, Frank Herbert's notes for, like, what he had planned for the Dune well, universe? I, I wasn't with him for that. The, the way that that came about is, um, it's a little bit more, more background. Frank Herbert wrote six Dune books. And at the end of his last Dune book, Chapter House Dune, it, it just ends on this big cliffhanger, like Luke, I'm your father kind of cliffhanger. And then Frank Herbert had... Uh, pancreatic cancer and he passed away fairly quickly. And so he never wrote the grand finale of that book or that, that series. And I was a huge Dune fan and I'd read all the other books and they were a giant impact on me. And I, um, I just always wanted to know how the Dune story ended. Uh, but in the meantime, I did my own writing career. My uh, first novel came out and then a bunch more came out and then I started working for Star Wars and then I started working for the X-Files and then my original work started being nominated for, you know, major like the Nebula Award and the Bram Stoker Award and all these things. And I finally got, got up the nerve to wonder, um, it had now been something like 10 years since Frank Herbert had passed away and his son, Brian Herbert, was already an established science fiction author and... In fact, the last book that Frank Herbert ever wrote was in collaboration with Brian called Man of Two Worlds. And finally, I just out of the blue, because all science fiction authors know each other. So I was able to get Brian's address. And I wrote him a letter that that just said, you know, I'm a huge Dune fan. And I'm really wondering if you're ever going to you know, finish the Dune story because your dad clearly left it on a cliffhanger with more to come. And, and would you ever um, finish it up? And if you're, if you're not going to, could we maybe work together on it? Because I want to know how the story ends. And so I just sent him this letter out of the blue, and I kind of expected nothing would, would come of it. And then, um, I don't know, several months later, uh, Brian called me up out of the blue, and we just kind of started chatting. We had, I'd never spoken to him before or met him or anything. And, and we just immediately hit it off. And, and my wife was in the room when I'm talking on the phone. And she says, after about 30 seconds, you guys just started speaking a different language. You were finishing <laughs> sentences and, and just, we really hit it off. 
And I asked Brian, like, did, did his dad have any outline of the last book or any notes or anything? And Brian said no, because his dad had it all up in his head that he would like take his copies of Dune and reread them and run through with a yellow highlighter and make notes. But he just had all the story in his head. And so we decided that we wanted to do um, like a prequel story, the, the early years of Duke Leto and Lady Jessica and the Baron Harkonnen and stuff, uh, because by now it had been 10 years since the last book came out and nobody was going into the bookstore waiting for it anymore. So we needed to get people interested in Dune again. So I flew up to the Seattle area to spend several days with Brian where we just brainstormed uh, in, until we were ready to drop with exhaustion. We made up this whole <laughs> outline for the, uh, for the trilogy and kind of took all of our notes. And, and then I came home and just sort of crashed for two days because my brain was just, just worn out. And then just at that time, which is this really weird coincidence, because Frank had been dead for like 10, 10 years or so. And the estate attorney called Brian up, like within the day or two after I had left him. The estate attorney said, um, so we're it's 10 years, we're closing up all of our records and boxing up everything and putting it into storage. And um, we're, we're closing out your dad's files and what do you want us to do with these safety deposit box keys we just found and brian didn't know anything about the safety deposit box keys and so he said well we better go and see what this is and so they they it's a bank in downtown seattle and they opened up i guess they had to drill out drill it out because the lock was so old and inside was um was some jewelry and photographs and some letters and recipes and a dot matrix printout of the outline for Dune 7, which was meant to be the, the grand finale of the whole thing. So, but because Frank, Frank had pancreatic cancer, like I said, um, he must have known. And he, he um, put the, the outline in there. Uh, might have been nice if he had told somebody where he put it, <laughs> but uh, we found it. And then, so we sold the first trilogy called the House of Trades, House Harkonnen, and House Carino uh, trilogy. We sold that uh, to Bantam Books, and it was the largest single science fiction contract in publishing history. So this is the Dune. This is a huge, huge thing. And Brian and I were we're going to get started working on this this trilogy. And at that time, Brian he owned an insurance office, and he was writing kind of part time off and on, but he wasn't a full time writer. And but. I am a full-time writer. I'm here. You can kind of see part of it in the background. I have a writing office. That's kind of my place that I go to, to do my writing. And, you know, when Brian knew that I had a big writing office, well, of course he needed a big writing office. Of course. And, and in their house, um, they, they live up, uh, they have a nice house as a three car garage. And, like what most people do with three car garages is you park your cars in two of them and you pile junk in the third one. And so they decided that the third garage uh, would probably be a good candidate for them to like wall it off and remodel it into Brian's writing studio. And so they're clearing it out. They, they take out the lawnmower and the boxes of kids clothes and the coffee cans and nails and everything. And, and up in the rafters, they found a, a Xerox paper box with Frank Herbert's writing, handwriting on the side that said Dune Notes. And inside that box, stuck up in the top of Brian's garage for who knows how many years, uh, there were close to 3,000 pages of wow. Frank's notes. Uh, he had pages and pages of those opening epigraph quotes that he would put in the chapters that he hadn't used. Uh, he had chapters he wrote, but then tossed away that he never used. Um, various drafts of things we found the he had back in the like late 50s he had outlined dune but as a completely different novel sort of like this quick science fiction adventure novel on a desert planet where uh two rival noble families were trying to see who could mine the most spice and win the emperor's blessing or something and we found all those notes which we then wrote up into a short novel called spice planet and was published in something called Road to Dune, along with a, a bunch, a bunch of the notes. Um, 
so anyway, it's just this. I could talk for hours about all that. <laughs> and I, I could listen for hours. But, you know, speaking of Dune, so, you know, you're one of the graphic novel. I got to show this off. It's our graphic novel. It's uh, this Brian. And I, like I said, I always love comics so much. And I've wanted to have a a definitive graphic novel adaptation of Frank's original novel. And so we finally get Abrams book. So it's a big, fine, uh, fine press publisher. And we, it's going to be in three volumes, just like the novel is in three volumes. And we, uh, it's like literally a, a scene for scene faithful adaptation of the novel Dune. So we've got, um, that's something that we, we just that's, love. That's awesome. That's awesome. And, you know, Kevin, I can remember when I was in high school, I went to like a Barnes and Noble and just on, on the side caps, like I saw like the House Atreides, House Harkonnen, like, like the, the big hardback books with like the em embossed covers and stuff like that i was like oh my god are there are there new dune novels and i saw like your name plastered on there i was like holy crap that's the star wars guy so like it, it was it was really cool like getting to see that and and especially like you know like i don't know how many decades it's it's been but like you guys have like a massive library of dune sequels and prequels and everything in between and you're kind of like the steward of of the dune saga nowadays like you, you've kind of taken on that mantle and i know that there's always been kind of like a like a, a thing with fans who you know whenever someone takes over a beloved franchise and they start making creative decisions and stuff like that there's always going to be a section of the fan base that disagrees with that you know like we we ha had situation with star wars we've had situation with star trek and Lord of the Rings, everything in between. And so I, I wanted to ask you, um, like, you know, how do you deal with criticism from like Herbert Purist and stuff like that about like uh, your creative choices with the franchise? Like, how do you navigate the pressures of being like in charge of like the, this beloved franchise and, and, and stuff like that? Well, my, my first encounter with all that stuff was when I was doing Star Wars books. And and it was a total shock to me because I had published, I think, seven or eight of my own books before that. And they were all critically acclaimed, which means that they got good reviews and nobody read them. So um, I, I had my own books out there, but I didn't have like this millions of people in a fan base. And so suddenly I was getting hate mail from people who basically hated me because I wasn't Timothy Zahn. <laughs> and I went, well, no, I'm not Timothy Zahn. I'm writing my own take on Star Wars. And uh, and I, I found that a lot of those people, um, they were Star Wars fan writers and they were just ticked off that I got the job and they didn't. And so for a long time, there were just people just arguing and, and I, I learned real quick not to engage and argue with them because you don't, you can't win. But the whole thing is, uh, my, my favorite one on all that was, I have a series that I wrote with my wife called the Young Jedi Knights series. Mm -hmm. And there were 14 volumes in the Young Jedi Knight series. And I had this person uh, post this real nasty thing on either Amazon or a Star Wars fan group that said that he had just finished reading the, the 14th and last of the Young Jedi Knights book. And he hated, hated, hated it. He said, I hated book 14 as much as I hated book 13, as much as I hated all the other 12 books before that. And I went, well, then why didn't you just stop reading? <laughs> there are other things. Um, but, you know, we, we study, we, we try to convey and, and give you the, the uh, experience of reading a Dune novel when, when we do a Dune novel. And I try to make sure that when you're reading one of my X-Files novel, that, that it feels like you're in the X-Files universe and watching an, an X-Files thing. And there are, because sometimes the, the troll fans are so um, they're so loud and so many capital letters and exclamation points that you, you get the misunderstanding that there are more of them than it looks like. And then you go back and you look on Amazon and we have like all of the Dune books, we have thousands and thousands and thousands of reviews. And of all, I think 16 books that we've done in the series so far, um, our lowest star rating our lowest rating of any of these books is four stars that's better than anything stephen king has that's better than than george martin and and i i mean even frank's original dune novels i don't think are that high. so people who read them like them and those are the people that i'm trying to cater to 
And those are the real Dune fans who are um, the ones who enjoy the books. And we enjoy this universe. We've spent 25 years of our lives just like immersed in in the sandbox and and trying to build the legacy of Frank Herbert. And, and really, uh, there's so much stuff. And with the new movie that just came out, all of Frank's books have been selling so well. Um, all of his other books are back in print now. And I kind of feel that that's my instead of paying it forward, that's my paying it backward to my Obi-Wan that, that I admired his work so much when I was just starting out as a writer. So um, we, we're we very proud of the books that we've done. Are, are there ever any instances where like, you know, you have the critics, uh, you know, uh, of your work where they come out and they're like, hey, we don't like this because, and like you find that there's actually like legitimate criticism there that helps inform you writing the next books or is it just all toxic? Well, the, if it's something that that oops, they really caught something. Well, then you you go ah, but you went, gotta wait for the next book because that's when it'll all be explained, and then you <laughs> try to fear. I mean, we did that a lot uh, in the Star Wars books because there was when I was writing them and Tim Zahn was writing them, and uh, there were other authors coming in. Uh, in the early days, there really wasn't anybody watching to make sure that everything was was all fit in order. And in fact, Tim did his uh, first trilogy at the same time that Tom Veach um, was writing this big graphic novel uh, called Dark Empire. It was a series for Dark Horse Comics. And they took place at right around the same time, like five or six years after Return of the Jedi. And their actions kind of contradict each other's stories. And Tim didn't know about Dark Empire and Tom Veach didn't know what Tim was writing. And so... Um, when I came in to write the Jedi Academy trilogy, um, I went to Lucasfilm and I said, but I'm reading Tim's books, but I'm also reading this Dark Empire thing. And, and how does this, this mesh? And, and they said, well, just, just pretend that the stuff in Dark Empire, just don't have them think about any of it. <laughs> and I went, but in Dark Empire, Leia has another baby. The emperor comes back as a clone and Luke goes to the dark side. It's not the kind of stuff you just forget about after like a bad hangover over a weekend. So I spent a lot of time writing the, the Jedi Academy trilogy so that it encompassed both Tim's books and Dark Empire so that it all fit back together. All right. Before we move on, I just want to remind everyone in chat, first of all, thank you for being here. Second of all, if you want your questions answered, be sure to hit us up in the super chats. Uh, but uh, again, we have limited time with Mr. Anderson, so I want to keep going. Uh, so one of the things that you tend to do like really well is you collaborate with other authors on various different stuff. Uh, you know, uh, you know, your clockwork uh, trilogy, uh, you know, the Dune books and stuff like that. And so uh, one of the things I wanted to ask you is what do you have advice on how to successfully uh, co-write with other authors? Because I know that there are a lot of people out there that probably want to work together, but like they, they're unsure how to do it or like they have conflicts. What in your experience is the best way to go about writing a, a novel with other authors? Well, a couple of things. One, you both have to make sure that you're enthusiastic about the story and you want to work together. And um, you've got to leave your ego at the door because you are no longer being a single parent. You now have to be co-parenting. You're, you're, you're creating this thing together. And you need to find somebody whose imagination is kind of like yours, but also supplements it. Like uh, for, for Brian and I, my background is in physics and astronomy, and I've got a minor in Russian history. And so I've got, I'm really good at like the tech stuff and, and space battles and all the, the careful plotting and, and big historical feel to things. And Dune has a lot of like epic historical feel to it. And Brian's background is in uh, philosophy and comparative religions. And so that's a perfect complement to my skill set. And so together, we can put together something that that feels like a, a Dune story. And so when you're collaborating, um, actually, there's another thing, too. You, you mentioned earlier in the show that I'm this fiendishly fast writer, and I write all the time, and I keep writing stuff. Well, if you're going to collaborate and you both hope to get a book done, you don't want to pick a co-author that takes 10 years to write a book, and you write a book in six months. So you'd never collaborate with George R. R. Martin? 
Is that I what you're don't saying? think I would ever collaborate. Well, there <laughs> there are different ways of doing a collaboration. I mean, that that's another whole thing. The way Brian Herbert and I do it, uh, and also the way uh, Rebecca and I do it, as because uh, we've written all the Young Jedi Knights books and all these other things, is we will talk out the whole story. That we'll, we'll brainstorm and and kind of a jazz performance. You put it all together until both authors have exactly the same story in their head. Like we, we both watch the same movie, so we know how to talk about it. And then we'll split up the, the work and I'll write for Dune books, they're like a hundred chapters long. So I'll write one, um, I'll write 50 of the chapters and Brian will write 50 of the chapters. And then we will edit our own chapters and then we'll swap and we'll edit each other's chapters and, and put them all together uh, until it's, and then we just edit the whole thing back and forth five, six, seven, eight times until it's as smooth as either until it's as smooth as we can possibly make it or until it's past the deadline and the publisher is screaming for it. So, uh, and then that's how we get it done. But you, um, you just, you play to each other's strengths. Like when we pick the chapters, um, we try to get like Brian does the more philosophical ones and I get the more um, action once because I'm I'm better at doing the space battles. But over the years we've kind of taught each other the other person's skills so we can we can hand it off back and forth as, as much as we can. What do you think of the expanse James SA Corey technique where you basically have two authors working together and they each just like take uh, alternating chapters where it's like, well, I'll write this chapter, you write the next chapter, I'll write the chapter after that. And then we'll just kind of like come together and, and try to, you know, make sure that everything makes sense. Uh, I, I actually didn't know what their technique was. I think they're magnificent. Those books are incredible. Uh, and they're so full of detail and they're so, um, and, and it does not sound like two different people um, are writing those books. And they're so tightly plotted. I'm, I'm kind of astonished if they're doing sort of a, like a round robin back and forth without plotting it ahead of time. I, I don't know, how, I, I don't know them personally, so I don't know how they're doing it, but however they're doing it is the right way to do it because those books turned out just exceptionally well. Yeah, they're, they're very good books. So let me ask you, um, you know, I met you, I first met you at uh, the 20 books to 50K conference out here in Las Vegas. And that's kind of like the big uh, coalescing of the independent author movement, where you have a bunch of independent novelists out there who are self-publishing and self-publishing is no longer stigmatized and people are making a very good living doing it. And you kind of come from the traditional publishing world and yet you're also in the indie publishing world. So I wanted to ask you, you, you know, um, where do you fall on the whole indie author revolution thing? And, uh, you know, uh, what advice would you give to authors who are kind of on the fence? Should people still go for the traditional publishing route or is it perfectly viable to go the indie route? Well, my, I founded Wordfire Press like in 2008. So I was kind of at the pretty, pretty close to the beginning of, of people doing their own indie books. And I, I kind of taught myself how to do it. And the main reason was that um, as you mentioned, I'm a pretty prolific author. And what happens in traditional publishing or what used to happen in traditional publishing is that you'd have a book that comes out and it would sell for a few months, maybe a year. And after that, nobody was buying it anymore. And traditional publishers would just let them go out of print. And I had a whole bunch of my, my early books that I wrote and I loved, but they were out of print. And then when uh, it was just Kindle at the time, I think, uh, when Kindle made it possible for people to just put their own books up, uh, I, I went, well, let's, I like a bunch of these old books. And now I'd publish all these Star Wars books. So now I have millions of fans where before I had dozens of fans. And, and now I've got all these books that people wanted to read and they were just buying them in used bookstores. Well, I, the author, don't make any money when somebody buys a book in a used bookstore. So yeah. we put up our first well, dozen books just just as our own like really sloppy Kindle books with kind of terrible covers on them. But this was early days. And so the people who had a Kindle, they grabbed everything because there just wasn't that many out there. And I was astonished. I mean, like in a year, I made as much money as the they made when they were in paperbacks. And so I said, hey, let's do a lot more of this. And I had other friends who also saw the potential, but they didn't want to learn how to do it. So they gave me their books that Wordfire Press then printed and 
that, well, ebooked, and then we transitioned into also doing print books, and and then we started taking on other authors and learning that whole business of publishing and and expanding it, and and boy, that is a learning curve that never stops. Whereas in traditional publishing, uh, and here I'll sound like this crotchety old old fart, but in traditional <laughs> publishing, I knew how everything worked, and I had it made, and I didn't have to learn anything anymore. Well. <laughs> And that kind of changed fundamentally. And uh, I still published, I'm a hybrid. I still publish um, a lot of my own books through Tor Books or um, Bantam or Titan or whatever publisher who's doing it. But I do a lot of my own stuff as well. And it depends on what the project is. I just, I've had like 150 short stories published over my career. And I wanted to do like this big four volume collection of the, the complete short stories of Kevin J. Anderson. Well, there's, there's no publisher, traditional publisher that would be interested in that. And so I thought, well, I'm just going to do it myself. And so I've got four big, beautiful volumes of, of um, my collected short stories. And it turned out that that really works well because to get back to the flood of empty promises in Hollywood, they always want to read your short stories because they can't read a novel. And a <laughs> short story, uh, a good complicated short story is, is a great basis for a movie. So I've got all kinds of producers wanting, do you have a short story about uh, Dracula? Do you have a short story about dragons? And now I've got them all collected in four volumes so I can just pull out one and send it to the, the producer. So anyway, I've done, um, I, I'm trying to keep up with the indie publishing movement. I see how it's growing. Uh, I, I suspect that there's a lot of people in traditional publishing that kind of have blinders on and they don't, they still think of it as, oh, that, that vanity press stuff where they don't realize that the vanity press people um, like Michael Anderley are selling hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of books Whereas a traditional publisher would be happy with twenty thousand dollars worth of books. And so, if if there's a young science fiction author out there who's wanting to get into the business, would you recommend he try to go the traditional publishing route, or would you recommend the indie publishing route for them? I'd recommend he doesn't quit the day job. Uh, and <laughs> I mean, there there are arguments to be made for either way. I mean, there are people that really, really, really want to be published by. Uh, Phantom books and find it in their local Barnes and Noble. If you're an indie author, you're you're really not very likely to just stumble upon your books in a in a Barnes and Noble. That just that's not how we distribute our books. But like I said, I'm a pretty fast writer, and if it the production process for a publisher, a traditional publisher, is is a year best case. And if you're already unknown and you haven't sold the book yet you'll mail your manuscript in and it might sit for three years in the slush pile before somebody reads it. Well, if I'm writing four or five books a year, that math doesn't really work out. So, you know, my option is to do it myself. And again, like you said, there isn't really the stigma anymore that people can produce very fine uh, books by their own, if they know what they're doing. And does a uh, word fire press take uh, submissions or anything like that? We're closed now. We got so many in the backlog and we're, we're trying to actually, we're trying to slow down a little bit so we can focus on the books more rather than just getting them out as fast as we can. Uh, in the early days, all that mattered was you got them out there because there were so many, it was a gold rush. There were so many people ready to, to grab your stuff, but now you need to spend a little bit more time and effort um, uh, trying to get, get it to the right audience. And so we want to focus a little bit more on, on selling our books. So long story short, we're not open for stuff right now. Right on. So we got a few super chats here. I uh, wanted to highlight. So uh, Gimpy G Gaming again for $4.99. Thank you, sir. What books and authors did you read long, long ago in a small town far, far away? Uh, I went through in, it was in a little, little small town library. I went through the spinner racks and I, I would grab all the paperbacks from Ray Bradbury. I loved everything that Ray Bradbury wrote. Uh, I read Dune when I was, I think, 10 or 11 years old. Uh, I went through all of the Edgar Rice Burroughs, John Carter of Mars books, which uh, was kind of just at the right time for me. And they were great adventures. I loved those. Um, 
those were kind of my big ones. Uh, Arthur C. Clarke, I read a lot of those. And then I, I discovered, I read The Hobbit and I just loved The Hobbit. And it was one of these most frustrating experiences because, um, because I couldn't talk to anybody about it. I was in this small town and nobody else read comics. Nobody else read stories about swords and dragons and hobbits. And, and it was very frustrating to me because this was before um, internet and social media. I mean, now you can always find somebody who's got the same interests as yours. But when you're, you're isolated in, in Oregon, Wisconsin, you didn't really have that option. And in a similar way, so we can like lead into the, the next thing we want to talk about. Uh, I didn't, we didn't have a, a record store or anything, but when you're in early high school, you want to get into rock music, especially music that will annoy your parents. And we had this thing called the Columbia Record Club. And they, it came in the mail. And if you signed up for it, you got like, like 10 albums for a dollar if you would sign up for their club. And I wanted all this music and I hadn't heard a lot of it. So I, I saw the, all these albums you pick from. They're like little stamps that you would put down on the sign up sheet. And there were a bunch of uh, albums by this rock group called Rush. And I'd never heard them before, but they had like science fiction pictures on the front covers of them and, and castles and, and uh, f flaming futuristic stuff. Yeah. And, and so I just picked all the Rush albums as part of my membership. And I just fell in love with this. And it was, I mean, there's much heavier stuff now, but at the time this was like really loud, heavy metal guitars and, and Getty Lee's voice is very high and wailing. And, and then the, the drummer, Neil Peart, is this huge... Uh, talented, complicated rhythms and stories were about necromancers and spaceships and black holes. And, <laughs> and I just, that's what I really fell in love with. And my very first novel, Resurrection Inc., was kind of my imaginary novel version of one of their albums called Grace Under Pressure. And it was because of that, that I got to know Neil Peart. I put him in the acknowledgments that uh, his work had inspired this novel and he read it and wrote me this letter about how much he enjoyed it. And we ended up corresponding for 31 years. We were very close friends. Uh, he just, he passed away of brain cancer about two years ago. And, but in, I think 2012 or so, uh, Rush was starting to work on their, what would be their last studio album. It was called Clockwork Angels, this big steampunk fantasy adventure that Neil was brainstorming with me because he he knew I wrote steampunk and he wanted to know all the uh, the details about airships and alchemy and everything. And then when he got all these songs written that kind of tell a story, uh, he asked me to write the novel version of it. And we, we wrote that together. It's called Clockwork Angels. And it became a New York Times bestseller and um, won some awards. And then a few years later, because we loved the world so much, uh, we did a second book called Clockwork Lives, which won the Colorado Book Award and, and personally is my favorite of all the books that I've written. And one of the stories in that book uh, gave Neil an idea for, hey, we could do a third one. And we were talking about how this adventure would tie everything together. And we brainstormed it. And I have a whole, a whole folder full of notes and some quotes and things. And we were, we were going to write this third book together. Uh, when we had time, because Rush had stopped touring, they had retired after 43 years on the road. And just when Neil was settling down to retire, he got diagnosed with terminal brain cancer. And that kind of put an end to that. And he and I, whenever we would meet, we talk a little bit about it. Um, but, you know, I just had all these notes. And then when he passed away uh, two years and three months ago, um, I, I had all these notes and I just looked at them and I put them away for a year. I couldn't, couldn't touch them. I couldn't think about it. I, I didn't know if I was ever going to do this, but at the one year anniversary of his death, and there was all kinds of memorials and things. And I just kept thinking about how we had planned to write this book together and all the notes we had and all the plotting. And so I pulled out those folders and I reread them and, and it just kind of lit a fire under me and, I, I wrote to his widow and I said, you know, Neil and I were working on this and, and I'm thinking about actually finishing it. And what do you think? Do, do you, do you want me to just put it away or do you want me to finish it? And she gave me her wholehearted support. And so I, I finally got it all fired up and um, 
I like I, I like to go out hiking, like I told you before. And I went to one of my favorite places on earth, which is the Red Rock Deserts in, in Southern Utah. I went out there for a week. And in that one week in March of 2021, I wrote, I think 55,000 words in this book in one week. And then I finished it the following week. And then I edited it and polished it up. And it turned out I finished the entire, the final, final finished manuscript was done 30 days after I wrote the first word of chapter one. And that is finally coming out. Clockwork Destiny comes out uh, on June 14th. And I'm just, I am so proud of this book. It turned out as, as good as anything that I've ever done. And I think Neil would be proud of it. And we've just, they're slip cased editions. It's ECW Press. They do just beautiful leather books. I'm going to show this, show this again, because it's got, uh, there's like yeah, that's gorgeous. Casting, it's leatherette uh, cover. Uh, it's got, look, look, end papers. Whoever does end papers in books anymore. And, and it's just, it's beautiful. Um, design and again, I, and, I, and can they get a signed copy through Wordfire Press? Yeah, Word, Wordfire Shop, Wordfire Shop. Wordfire. Where I've got uh, signed copies, and there's also like the deluxe slip cased and numbered and everything in there. But um, this is, uh, and you can buy all three of them if you're if you're new to the Clockwork Universe, you can just get the whole set. But yeah. this, you know, I've I've written a lot of books, and I'm 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 I love all these characters, and I love telling these stories, but. The clockwork books are like like the the closest to my heart. They're the ones I'm just yeah. really. And reading. if you're a fan of Rush, you should check them out because they're based off of you know the albums. Um, and it, it's kind of funny, Kevin. I think uh, one of my favorite quotes of yours is you talk about writing in different genres because you're primarily known as science fiction, but you kind of compared it to cooking, where it's like sometimes you cook Mexican, sometimes you cook Italian, sometimes you cook you know whatever. And uh, it, to me, like as an author, that's very much you know just writing in different genres. Like you're still a good cook. It just you know you change the flavor of what it is you're cooking. Mm -hmm. So we got two two more super chats we need to get through real quick before I let you go. I know I know your time is valuable. So yeah. I don't, I don't want to monopolize your time too much. So from Fluffy Panda for $2, what goes into killing off established characters? Murderous intent. Um, <laughs> you know, that's, if you're talking about something like in Star Wars or whatever, that, that boy, they, they almost never let you do that unless it's part of a big overall plan. Um, I, in one of my novels for Star Wars, Darksaber, uh, this was like in the first, I don't maybe first five, six years of the Star Wars books coming out and people were like reading them and they're really enjoying them. But this was at a time where like nothing ever really changed. Nobody, nobody died. Nothing ever, ever changed. And I wanted to, I, I'm, I'm meeting with Lucasfilm all the time. And I, I wanted to just kill off somebody from the movies. And there's a, General Crix Maydine, who's in uh, Return of the Jedi, he has all of like one line in in one one scene where they're going over the Death Star plans, and you know it, it's on. I'm sorry, it's been a long time since I worked on this, but the like, key says five six words. Well, I said, why don't we just kill off Crix Maydine? And they said, but Kevin, he's from the movies. I said, yeah, but he's got like one line. So they said, sure. So I he dies this huge heroic death and in, in in Dark Saber, and I would say spoiler alert, but geez, it's been out twenty some years. <laughs> been a while, yeah. Uh, and so um, we killed off Crix Maydine, and the fan uproar. Oh my gosh, the, how can you how can you do this? And and now we we aren't complacent about Star Wars anymore because who's next? They could kill off Han Solo, and and <laughs> well, oh, if they only knew, if they only knew. But yeah. anyway, that um, but I've. Of course, in my, my Spine of the Dragon trilogy, like I did say, it's like Game of Thrones in that we do kill off a lot of characters by the time it's over. And and it, look, if you're having this war that's spanning two continents and the end of the world is at stake, somebody's going to get more than a hangnail. And, you know, it's it's going to happen. And you want the readers to feel something when the characters um, get killed, because if they don't feel anything, then you didn't make the characters real enough for them. And... It hurts me as an author to kill them. Well, sometimes I take great delight in killing them, but um, you know, I want to feel something too when I'm getting rid of this person that I've created from 
whole clock. But when when the plot demands it, and when the story is getting to this point, and and you know you really want them to be a a heroic something if they can, or a or an evil dastardly thing, and and you just want their their death to make an impact. Uh, although I have had times where um, my test readers are about to like tie me up and lock me in a closet unless I kind of like the character from Misery, right? And you know, yeah. oh, you better bring her back somehow. And and I have had a couple of characters that I fully meant to kill off, but I was not allowed to kill them off. And <laughs> well, I would also just add to that fluffy panda that uh, number one, you always want established characters to have completed their arcs or in their dying, they complete their arcs because you don't want to have like an undeveloped character killed off if, if they're established. And also, um, you know, make their death significant, you know, make it earned, like don't just uh, pull a deep blue sea and have them just die suddenly. And like that, that's that, you know? Uh, so like, that would be my advice uh, in addition to that, because, you know, like all authors love to like kill off established characters and torture their audience and all that good stuff. So we have one more super chat here from Backyard Tardis for $10. He asks, what is your favorite Star Wars character to write for? Wow. Well, I mean, there are so many. And of course we, we created a bunch of our own. So if it's a character from the movies, um, it's probably Han Solo because he's sort of the swashbuckler and he gets he has a good sense of humor and he gets in a lot of trouble and and he's he's kind of fun. Um, Luke Skywalker was fun because he was kind of, especially post Return of the Jedi, Luke Skywalker. He's kind of a, a grim lost soul who's dealing with uh, the stuff that's happened and he's trying to deal with his powers. Uh, but it was a little bit hard because as you made him more and more of a powerful Jedi, it was hard to come up with a bad enough thing to hit him with. Um, of my own characters, though, the ones that I really, really loved so much uh, were the Tales of the Jedi comics, the ones set 4,000 years before the movies. And it was this whole different set of characters in a whole different landscape. And I loved um, Ulic Keldroma. I loved uh, Exar Kun, who's my, my bad guy, Sith Lord. And telling those stories was something that I just really, there was just so much freedom and imagination to put into them. So I like those. All right. So uh, I want to ask you one more question real quick before we sign off. And I, I know you're busy, uh, so maybe you can just keep, keep the answer short or what have you. But I wanted to ask you about comic book writing versus novel writing because you're very prolific in comic books. So what's the difference between writing for novels and writing for comics? And if there are writers out there who want to get into comic books, how would you recommend they break into the business? Well, one of the cool things about writing comics, especially when I'm writing comics, I usually like to know my artist that it's a real it's a real team effort rather than me just writing a script and then I don't see anything until the finished comic comes out. Um, so I like to really be with the artist because you know pictures worth a thousand words. So my artist is worth many 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 thousands of words. And so if you can lean on your artist and let them do a lot of the heavy lifting, like I'll, I'll say. Um, Jedi lightsaber battle for seven panels, knock yourself out. And then the artist just does it. And I see other comic writers would say, panel one, he lifts the lightsaber and panel two, he kicks and panel three there. And the artist is a more visual person than I am. And so I like to give them the freedom and where they're, um, where they're best at. Um, but I, in a novel, you have a lot more room to explain things. You can have more natural dialogue because they can like talk for pages. In a comic, you've got like a, how many words will actually fit in that word balloon? So you can't have them talking for five sentences. Um, so you, it, it's kind of a short and sweet and, and beautiful. And, and it's, you're basically writing a slideshow or, or a PowerPoint presentation to tell a story. Each little PowerPoint slide is one panel and you have to, you can skip things, you can convey things, and it's really kind of a, a shorthand skill to figure out how to do that. Uh, but writing novels, you've got all the room in the world. You can do whatever you want. You can explain things. You have inner dialogue. You can you can do plenty, and that's that's why it was such a uh, 
showing off again. Oh, I was such a challenge to write the Dune graphic novel because Frank wrote a novel. He went on for pages and pages of them thinking stuff and then they're and nobody's doing anything. They're just sitting in a room. And so that's really hard to do visually and fast. And and there's a big challenge between the two of them. But uh, to break into comics, it's it's about as easy as breaking into publishing. It, it's just you got to find the right person, find the right skill. Um, on my um, the Clockwork Angels novel that I wrote with Neil Peart, we also adapted that into uh, a comics as well. And for somebody who really is interested in the nitty gritty, and you can find it on on the Wordfire Shop page. I published a book called Clockwork Angels, the comic scripts. So you'll get the actual six comic scripts that I wrote conveying the book into a comic. And so if you're, you're really interested, you can check out that book and, and see exactly how I write panel descriptions and dialogue and everything. So Kevin, your Clockwork trilogy, um, you know, is, is coming to a close, you know, uh, you worked on it very closely with your friend, Neil Pert before you, tragically passed away. And uh, I want to encourage everyone out there to go to Amazon or Barnes and Noble or wherever you prefer to buy your books from, or even wordfire.com. So like you can get a signed copy of the first book, wordfireshop.com. Wordfireshop.com. Wordfireshop Word, Word uh, so uh, the first book is called Clockwork Angels. And the second book is called Clockwork Lives. And uh, the third book coming out is Clockwork Destiny that's coming out in June. So uh, maybe you're watching this in the future and it's already out. So be sure to get like the full trilogy, check it out. Uh, it's it's steampunky, it, it's really interesting. It's kind of like a hero's journey, but it's also based off of like the Rush songs and the Rush albums and all that fun stuff. And uh, it's really worth checking out. In fact, we got a uh, little image here just to kind of show it off a little bit. And, uh, Kevin, thank you so much for, for coming on tonight. I wish you were a little bit less legendary so I could have more time to talk to you about this stuff, but uh, I want to respect your time. I really appreciate you spending the hour with us, uh, kind of like sharing your, your wisdom and your, your advice and your career. And hopefully you'll come back on in the future so we can get into some of the topics that we didn't have time to get into tonight. Uh, but where can people find out more about you and what are you going to be working on next? Uh, any movies on the horizon, any new series coming out uh, that you'd like to tell people about? Well, movie stuff is always, you never know until it actually shows up in the theater. So uh, you keep trying that. Um, the, the, I have a brand new Dune book that also comes out at the end of June called Sands of Dune. It's a collection of our Dune short stories. And then another one called The Heir of Caladan, the third book in a trilogy, a Dune trilogy. That comes out in, I think, October. Uh, the second volume of the Dune graphic novel comes out in August. Um, I've got, I just ran my, we didn't even talk about the, the Dan Chamble Zombie PI series. I've got book eight in that series that uh, comes out in November. We just ran a very successful Kickstarter for it. So Kickstarter backers are getting their novel tomorrow, but everybody else gets <laughs> it in November. Uh, and after that, we're just kind of, I mean, now I'm kind of thinking of, well, what's the next big thing? And and Brian and I are discussing some Dune projects and, and I might do another Dan Chamble book because I love the series and and you know otherwise I might just relax and watch football games on a Sunday afternoon or something like that or not yeah yeah no everyone else will be watching football you'll be up writing uh, like, like a good author should uh, anyway Kevin thank you so much for coming on the stream uh, really had a great time talking to you and uh, thank you everyone in the chat especially those of you who gave us uh, some super chats so Gimpy uh, Fluffy Panda, uh, Backyard Tardis, Nick. Thank you guys so much for s helping to support the stream. And uh, one final goodbye to Kevin J. Anderson, our special guest tonight. Thank you, sir. You were a gentleman and a scholar, and we appreciate your time. Mm -hmm.